We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the darkened hour. Sorry. Welcome to another episode of the darkened hour. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. With me today is Terry McDermott. McDermott, whose career as a journalist spans over 30 years, while also being a former national reporter for the Los Angeles Times. He is also the author of two books, which we will speak on today, Perfect Soldiers, The 9-11 Hijackers, Who They Were, They Did It, and The Hunt for KSM, Inside the Pursuit and Takedown of the Real 9-11 Mastermind, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, which he co-authored with Josh Meyer. Following the publication of Perfect Soldiers, McDermott has been interviewed in several documentaries on the 9-11 attacks, including the Hamburg cell in general, the History Channel on 9-11, Inside the Hamburg Cell, the National Geographic Channel, Documentaries Inside 9-11, and 9-10, The Final Hours. Welcome to the show, Mr. McDermott. Thank you for coming. Glad to be here. Well, let's start off real simple. Um, let's start off with your career at the LA Times. How did that begin? Well, the LA Times was actually my eighth newspaper. So I, I kicked around a little bit. Um, I, I started working journalism because is it was a way to write and get paid basically um and um so i started in the midwest i worked at a couple of uh, a paper in iowa the omaha world herald and then moved to the northwest pacific northwest and worked in portland and seattle before coming to la came to la just because we had good job offers here hmm. the la times was hiring my my wife is also a journalist and we, we came together in 98 um and she's still working for the LA Times. I mean, I, I left 10 years ago to just to pursue my own stuff. But, you know, it, it for a moment was was an astonishingly good place to work. Uh, they were ambitious, they had new leadership. Hmm. They really wanted to do great stuff. Uh, in fact, my uh, I got my first assignment on 9-11 was to do a profile of Mohammed Atta, the lead uh, hijacker, hmm. the lead pilot. And my boss told me, I mean, my orders were, he said, go wherever you need to go, stay as long as you need to stay. You know, if a newspaper editor said that today, you get fired on the spot. You know, mm -hmm. it's just the, the resource consumption that requires. I mean, I, the LA Times had to spend half a million dollars on my travel, you know, and you're, cause you're, every day you're hiring translators, you're hiring drivers, you're hiring security. Uh, it's, it's just a mess, you know, and you can't do anything without it. It's really expensive. I mean, that's only a big news organization could afford to do that kind of reporting. An individual couldn't do it. Um, right. Now, this led you to write your first book in 2006, which was Perfect Soldiers. Um, it also is the, old, the sole book which concentrates on just the hijackers. Was this the reason for writing the text? And what gave you the idea? Well, um, I wrote the book to memorialize the reporting I had already done. <clears throat> and and to to fund more reporting basically i mean i was i was from the, from the day of 911 i worked on on that story for the next couple of years um and I, it, in the first weeks months after everywhere you went there were tons of reporters international news crews from here and there but the longer you stayed in the field, the fewer of them you ran into. And eventually there wouldn't be anybody. Hmm. I mean, they all had their story and they were gone. Um, so I'm plowing away at this, you know, did the initial story on, on Muhammad Atta. Uh, and what we learned doing that was that he was not capable in any way of being a leader. 
he was a he was a dutiful guy. I mean, he was a good soldier. Uh, he would do what he was told, but he couldn't come up with this stuff. He wasn't a he had, didn't have a creative bone in his body. Um, and so that you know, the obvious next question is then you have got here's Ada and the hijackers here, and you got Bin Laden up there, and it's like, what's in between? So I spent you know most of a year trying to figure out what sort of network existed, who the recruiters were, who who was the the person whose idea this was, and found nothing. <laughs> you know, mm. there was no network. Uh, these guys, the the hijackers were all volunteers. I mean, they just showed up. Uh, they weren't they weren't sought. Um, and out of this mess there emerged this just one guy, College Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, and there really wasn't anything between him and the hijackers. I mean, it was a very small organization. You know, you would, you know, every time you would meet somebody who had been a jihadi or, or you read about them somewhere, um, it, it was always amazing that they had all known, they'd all met bin Laden and, and, and lots of them had met uh, KSM. And, and I thought, man, that's just weird. I mean, I don't, you know, how many people here may have met the president? You know, it's just, right. it doesn't happen. But I realized finally that it's a tiny organization and it, it's actually, it's, it's small size was one of the things it had going for it. You know, most of the people who were terrorism experts talked about it as this massive thing with global reach and tentacles here and there. That's not, that's just bullshit. Uh, I mean, it doesn't, it's not like that at all. It's, it's in the hundreds or th small thousands of people around the globe. It just wasn't a big deal. And if you think about it, 9-11 didn't require a big deal. Probably cost, I probably spent more money investigating 9-11 than they did actually doing it. Hmm. I mean, it, 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 I, think that I added it up one time. It was like $350,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And most of that was for apartments and hotels. Right. You know, it just, it, it didn't, it doesn't take a lot of money. Um, so I'm, I'm working on this. I get a call from uh, a literary agent uh, who I had written prior to 9-11, a profile of uh, NWA, the, the gangster rap group, mm -hmm. and the history of that and where it came from. And he, this guy called me up and said that he was an agent, but also he was the editor of a collection of music writing, and, and they'd selected this piece to be in it. And he called to congratulate me, and, and then to suggest, he says, you should write a book on this. And I go, well, you know, I, I'm kind of involved in something else right now. My head's not not where that was, for sure. He says, well, what are you doing? And I told him, you know, I'm doing 9-11 stuff, and we talked for a little bit. He says, well, that's a book. So <laughs> right. eventually it became a book. And I did it just to memorialize the, the the reporting because it was really hard to do, and and I was I was you know probably too proud of it, but but I thought it was worth keeping, worth ha having available. Sure, you um, you start off in the book with Egypt and Muhammad Atta growing up in Cairo with his father and mother. It seemed that he grew up uh, as Egypt was transitioning from the Sadat Sadat government to Mubarak. Under Sadat, the Muslim Brotherhood was growing. Uh, while more extremist branches such as Al-Jihad, which later became Egyptian Islamic Jihad, and right. Gamma Islamiyah. Uh, was this important to help shape the mindset of Vata? Uh, almost the absence of it, I think, in, in, in this case. He was a very coddled child. And his father was a, an ambitious bureaucrat, basically. He was a lawyer. Um, and to be, to be political in those times in Egypt was to be uh, an enemy of the state, you know, and to be religious was to be political. Yeah. So, I mean, Muhammad Atta never went to a mosque the whole time he lived in Cairo. No, nobody in the family did. His father wouldn't allow it. He didn't want them to be associated with religion. Um, so obviously uh, these movements existed there and you'd have to be deaf and dumb not to know about it. And Ada was a well, bright enough guy to, to know. And in fact, you know, when he went to college at, at Cairo University mm -hmm. and in the, in the engineering department where he was, there were, uh, it was a hotbed for the brotherhood. Right. So he had to know people, he had to have met people, but the father kept him, you know, tight away from it, packed away. And when he went abroad to Germany for graduate school, the first he stayed with the host family the first couple of weeks. And the first question he asked on the first day in Hamburg 
was where's the nearest mosque? Hmm. You know, he, yeah. So, I, you know, he was aware, but that world hadn't been available to him. And he gets to Hamburg, and Hamburg has a significant um, Muslim population, but almost all of them are Turks. Uh, the Turks are the biggest minority group in Germany. And there are only three or four uh, Arab mosques in the whole city. And he eventually found one of them, Al Quds, and, and you know, as luck would have it or not have it, it was one of the most radical mosques in mm -hmm. Europe. And he just, you know, he shows up there and eventually becomes radicalized. He 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 seems to go against the pale, just like um, with Zia Jara. In chapter four, you characterize Jara as being an unlikely candidate for Islamism. While growing up in the um, Becca Valley in Lebanon, he was raised non-religious, much like almost in the same face as like Atta did. And even though he had friends who were Christians, um, for me, he went, this to, he went to Catholic school. Right, he went to Catholic school. Um, and But he never seemed to fit that jihadi profile. Was this something you considered while writing the book? Oh, for sure. I mean, I, it's still a mystery to me. Uh, how, what happened with Jara? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've, he shows up, you know, he's a party boy in Beirut. Everybody's <laughs> a party boy in Beirut. <laughs> Right, uh, it's one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. Beirutis think they live in the center of the universe. Uh, they're like Parisians and New Yorkers. I mean, they they just it, this is this is why would you be anywhere but here? Uh, you know, his uh, his family had some money. Uh, you know, he, his his car when he was in high school was a Mercedes. You know, so, and he goes abroad to Germany for college, mainly be because his parents gave him one or two options. You could go to Canada or Germany. Well, Canada was like, who knew where, where that was even on the map? And so he goes to Germany and, and the, the town he ends up in initially uh, is up, out in the former East Germany near the Polish border. Just this, it was like, he gets there in what, what year would it have been? 1998 or I can't remember exactly, but this town, Greifswald, was like it was 1958. It was so far behind the times. I mean, the fashions and clothing look like you know something out of the pages of an old magazine. Um, and here's this cosmopolitan party boy from Beirut, and he's in this dark gray, you know, out of time, out of date place. And within six months, he becomes radicalized. It just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. Um, that, and I mean, the most obvious thing that happened with him was there was, there was a local, uh, a small little, uh, mosque and the guy who ran it was a dental student. Uh, and he sort of took Gerard under his wing and, uh, this guy, uh, was, you know, he tried to police everybody's actions. You know, you don't do this, you don't do that. You know, and we've got photos of Draw like taking hits off a giant bong and mm. you know, drinking beer. And then, you know, the other half of his life, he's under the influence of this this other guy, this Yemeni guy. Um, and you know, somewhere in there, he 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 converts uh, psychologically. Um, it, it's a it's a strange thing because it did not. There was no event. There was no big deal. No nothing. You know, a lot of the other hijackers uh, grew up more in a uh, in an islamic world than Gerard did um and to how he made the the change in a really short space of time is something i mean it, 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 it led a lot of people to think that you know he was the one uh, maybe the weakest one the one most likely to to not go through with it and i always thought it was kind of the opposite because he made a conversion of some sort and you know, converts are, you know, they become the, the leaders of movements. Uh, and I think that he made a conversion and, and he, he actually had a life he was leading. I mean, he had a wife, uh, this gregarious Turkish German woman. Uh, they like to party, uh, they, they like to have a good time. And he made the conscious choice to move, to put that behind him. And I think there's some more fervent belief in him than people 
credit. He he had met. I I believe I want to say that the person that he met that you were talking about, the imam, was uh, uh, some either Abdul Rahman Al Magdadi, or uh, this uh, this person by the name of Marcel K, who was the vice president of the Islamic Center in North Bryan, Westphalia, um, because he he keeps contacting. No, Marcel. it was Makati. It was Makati. That's who. That was Makati. Okay. Yeah. Um, in regards to Zia Jar, just you know, because I agree with you, it seems like out of all of them, he just didn't fit. I mean, when you look at the muscle hijackers, most of them are from uh Saudi Arabia, and these people from rural Saudi Arabia, right? The rural, rural parts, yeah. Um, then you have this mysterious profile of like Zia Jar's family. I mean, his uncle Asim Al Jar was a spy for Libya, Germany, and Syria. And he had a cousin, Ali al Jar, who was a spy for Israel for over 25 years while being involved with Hezbollah, along with his brother. Um, besides all this, Zia Jar is still accepted within the highest ranks of Al-Qaeda as being involved with the planes operation. Either Al-Qaeda had lacked proper security or they just didn't bother to conduct background checks on those who were taxed to being involved in the biggest terrorist organization in, uh, operation in history. Well, again, I think this points to the, their lack of sophistication. Right. Uh, you know, it, it's they were it, it's it's an amateur organization. There are no professionals. There was no background checks on anybody. Um, and you know, these the hijackers weren't in on anything, right? Mm -hmm. they, uh, they didn't know anything. I mean, they didn't even it, it didn't even know the targets. Didn't know the dates. They didn't know anything until the day before. Yeah. Um, so, there was, you know, the security risk was small, I think. But yeah, it, the, the hijackers showed up just as they were needed. I mean, you know, KSM had pitched the plan to Bin Laden two years earlier yeah. in '96, and Bin Laden said it's too complicated. God, you know, what are you talking about? And at that point, there were like. 20 planes coming from each coast and and KSM was going to fly one of them and land in Oklahoma and give a speech. You know, it was just, it was a bizarre thing. Um, utterly, utterly amateur hour. Um, and no, I'm sorry about this. Let me shut this off. Um, it, but he eventually pitched another version of it, a scaled down version of it in 98 to bin Laden and bin Laden, bin Laden okayed it then. And then it was like, well, we got a plan. We need people, we need pilots. And these five guys from Hamburg show up. I mean, literally within a couple of weeks, right. they were looking for people who, who could accommodate living in the West, who were somewhat technical so that they at least could learn to fly airplanes. And they just, they were there they were. It was like a, a gift, uh, just manna from heaven for KSM. It just seems so convenient that here the, you yeah. know, these people just show up in Afghanistan and they meet, you know, the highest uh, Al Qaeda operatives of all, like Mohammed Atef, the military commander, yeah. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and Osama bin Laden. And this is something that I uh, sometimes would go over with the, my co host, Richard Cox, at the talking hour. Um, like it, it, it seems surreal that here they are without any vetting whatsoever, and they're involved with the most important operation in. Uh, the, the terrorist organization's history. Um, right, but it, it, you know, it could have gone off track any number of different ways and we would never have heard of it, right? right. And and it wouldn't have, or, or if we discovered traces of it later, we'd think, well, that was kind of a goofy idea. What were they, what were they thinking? Hmm. Uh, it's just, you know, KSM had 20 ideas a day for killing people. Hmm. I mean, it was just, he was feral. You know, this, these ideas would just come out of nowhere. Um, and this was one of them and he got somebody to fund it. There you go. Right. Uh, yeah, the, again, the fact that the hijackers met Atif, Bin Laden, um, it seems surprising, but then if you think about how small Al Qaeda is, everybody met him. Mm. I mean, every truck driver, every cook met Bin Laden. Half of the guys still at Guantanamo were, you know, new, new Bin Laden, mm. uh, and, and they weren't high ranking anything. Well, let's go back into like the, the ideology itself. The Afghan-Soviet war is one of your main drivers for the birth of the Islamic Wahhabi sects we witness today. 
Um, and this helped to replace the Cold War. Uh, rather convenient as this would become an even far more globally insidious problem, which was helped precipitated by the Saudis, in which they pumped tens of millions of dollars into madrasas and Islamic charities linked to these groups. Which Still gave, do. Yeah, and, and gave rise to the uh, influence much of the terrorist acts we witnessed from today, from 1990 to present day. Yeah. I mean, they've infected whole societies. I mean, you go to Pakistan. The Saudis and the Iranians have been having a, a proxy war in Pakistan for mm -hmm. 40 years, 30, 30 years. You know, the, there are there are whole sections of like Karachi, which is a huge city. There are whole sections where the cops won't even go because this war is going on and they don't want to get caught in a crossfire. Um, and it's, it's not Saudis who are dying. You know, it's Pakistanis. Mm. Uh, it's it's not it's not Persians who are dying. It's Pakistanis. And this gets replayed, you know, all over in Yemen, th throughout the the Middle East. Uh, it's a sad fact, and and you know the people who are its victims don't even know who the perpetrators are to a certain extent. Mm. That's it's it's quite sad. You know, people. I'd never been to Pakistan before I started this reporting, but people who had lived there, Pakistanis, but also Westerners, uh, back in the seventies uh, and eighties would describe it as idyllic, like this, this, this astonishingly beautiful place, this the great people, great culture, great food. And now it's just, <laughs> they've been, it's been a civil war for how many decades? It's just mm. it's terrible. The, and people accommodate to it. People live their lives as if it's not going on. But, you know, bodies turn up in the, on the streets in the morning. It just makes you wonder why the United States itself would still be an ally to Saudi Arabia, but I mean, the, the main driving factor is the oil, uh, reg, uh, oil sure. business. Yeah, I mean, that, the, not the main driving factor, the only factor, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think uh, you're right. Yeah, enough. Because there's nothing in ideal, ideologically uh, that even remotely uh, has any type of resonance with the United States, whether it be politically or religiously, we're so far apart in that regards. And you, it makes you want to really concentrate on the issue of Saudi Arabia in itself. It's based on a, a, a monarchy that is built upon uh, an un-Islamic principle called Wahhabi Islam, uh, which is a heretical puritanical sect created by a nomad, uh, Muhammad Ibn Abdullah al Salam uh, um, Wahhab, um, who helped shape the foundation of Saudi Arabia. And it's still, uh, permeates till today. And, you know, we have media that, that says, well, Saudi Arabia is going through reformations, uh, but that's not necessarily the case, is it? People have been saying that for years, yeah. decades, actually, and it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I don't, I don't know much about the Saudi royals, the royal family, but I think most of, the, most of them or many of them don't believe in any of that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. They believe in mm -hmm. money. And they 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 made a deal with the Wahhabis, you know. Uh, you know, we'll enshrine your ideology as the state ideology, mm -hmm. as long as we have to keep the, the oil and the money. And that's been going on since they found the oil. I mean, it's otherwise it's it's an inconsequential place. Even without the money, it's nobody would even know it existed hardly. Right. Right. I mean. It, with, without the without the oil, it would be Yemen, right? Yeah. Just a, a pov poverty stricken, strict, stricken outpost somewhere off in the distance. You you took care to mention Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in chapter two of your book, in which he studied at the University of North Carolina Agriculture and Technical State University here in Greensboro. Um, his life there was troubled by racism from other students who had an effect on his psyche. And it's here he begins his hatred for the United States as he slowly becomes involved with supporting the Mujahid in 1987, joining his brother, Zahed, in Peshawar. After some years uh, passed, he meets with Ramzi Youssef, his nephew, in the Philippines in 94 and begins working on the Bajinka plot. Can you explain for our listeners what the Bajinka plot was and whether this was the birth of the planes operation? Well, to answer the last part first, yeah, I think it was. I think the planes operation 9/11 was 
really just the marriage of the first World Trade Center attack and Bojenka. Hmm. It was using airplanes to attack American landmarks. Um, in this case, you know, they, they, rather than having bombs on the airplanes, which Bojenka was all about, uh, they had pilots and they turned the planes into missiles. Uh, seems more complicated actually and harder to pull off but but yeah but Jenko was Ram, Ramsey and Ramsey Youssef whose actual name is Abdul Basit hmm. uh, is KSM's sister's son and uh, KSM was the youngest in a family of eight and Ramsey was the oldest in a large family so they were only like two or three years apart in age uh, KSM is his uncle, but you know they were more comrades than they were. There's any hierarchical relationship there, and they grew up together in um, a little town called Fahil outside of Kuwait City, where uh, both of their fathers were, were. KSM's father was a a preacher, an imam at a, at a mosque, and you know he and Ramsey went to the same schools at the same time, um, ran around together as kids. Um, I don't know this for a fact, but I know uh, about Ramsey, but, but for sure, KSM, uh, his brother Zahed, was, was the student head of the local Muslim Brotherhood hmm. um, and took KSM with them to the, these like summer camps that they would have out in the desert. Uh, and so, he, and, you know, Kuwait in those days, in fact, much of the Middle East in those days, Almost all of the civil servants, the teachers, uh, the middle levels of bureaucracies were Palestinian exiles. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Palestinians were by far the best educated pe people in the, in the Middle East. Um, and when they were, when they left Palestine, they became the, in, these key figures throughout civil society. Um, and so almost all of KSM's teachers were Palestinian. Um, almost all of the people who ran the local Muslim Brotherhood were Palestinian. And he was in, indoctrinated into this at a very young age. I mean, it was just part of the air you breathe. Um, and so I think he actually had a, a true uh, political motivation uh, uh, on behalf of the Palestinians against Israel and therefore against the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and so then, he, yeah, he goes to, to college in the United States where he's treated like you, you might imagine. Uh, not well, and and that further you know hardens him against the United States. And then when he gets his degree in mechanical engineering, goes back to Kuwait. His brothers have already left for Peshawar, and and for the jihad. So he goes to join them. And not long after he gets there, a year or two, the Soviets withdraw. And when the Soviets withdraw, the U.S. withdraws its money, leaving them, you know, without a, a sponsor. And Within a couple months of that, KSM's younger brother gets killed in a, in a senseless, you know, after the war is over attack uh, and steps on a, uh, walks into a minefield, gets killed outside Jalalabad. Uh, and I think, you know, being raised with the, the Palestinian cause, the brotherhood, the treatment in the United States, the abandonment of the jihadis by the United States after the Soviets left and the death of his brother. I think that set him on his path for the rest mm -hmm. of his life. I think that was, you know, usually if you, you know, as a, as a reporter, you're looking for, you're trying to figure out why people did things and you're lucky if you can find, you know, a trace of, a, of evidence that would suggest why. In this case, I think it's so clear, right? It would put him mm -hmm. on the path. Uh, I mean, any, any one of those things would be enough for, an ordinary person, I think. Um, and so he, he was just a, a hardened um, believer at that point. And at, he, Ramsey Youssef, Abdul Basit, uh, was the guy who bombed the World Trade Center in 93 the first time. Um, his goal had been to knock one building over and topple into the other, which seems absurd until we actually see that <laughs> they can yeah. be toppled. Um, and, but and KSM never had a, a, a functioning part in that plot, but he did send money, and he talked to K to Ramsey while he was here in the in the country, and so he, he gave him like five hundred and fifty dollars or five hundred and sixty dollars or something like that. The whole bomb that cost three thousand dollars, and Ramsey said later that you know if he'd had more money, mm. he'd have built a bigger bomb. He just ran out of money, 
and they decided when to place the bomb when the money was gone. <laughs> uh, and you know, still they got the. It could have been much worse. I mean, it could have really uh, affected the building. It turned out it wasn't powerful enough to do that. Uh, so. It, Almost everybody involved in, in the first World Trade Center bombing was caught pretty quickly. Yes. They were just a bunch of local mooks, you know, people that mm. he, uh, they, they, they weren't hardened criminals or anything like that. Uh, but Ramsey got away and became kind of a celebrity in, mm. the, in, the, in the jihadi world. Uh, this is the guy who had attacked the United States and gotten away with it. Um, and, I mean, everybody knew who he was. I mean, bin Laden, I mean, KSM said, you know, years later that one of the reasons he was able to meet with bin Laden was because bin Laden knew he was Ramsey's mm -hmm. uncle. Um, so he and he, Ramsey goes back to Karachi, goes back to Pakistan after the bombing. And, and he and KSM come up with this idea of, you know, Ramsey was a, a pretty skilled technician. He knew how to make uh, electrical devices and and he had an idea of how you could make uh, tiny little bombs you could smuggle onto airliners and assemble once on the plane hmm. and, and leave behind. And, and they, so the idea was he would build these little bombs and he and KSM would get a crew of people to plant the bombs on different airliners. And, and so the, the eventual form it took was 12 different U U.S. flagged air carriers would, would fly from Asia from East Asia to the United States, and all of them would have bombs placed on them, and the bombers would would exit the planes at intermediate stops, and the planes would all fly off uh, east to the United States, and on one glorious day they would all blow up, you know, within an hour of one another, um, and you know they probably would have gotten away with it. They figured they did a test run with the bomb. The bombs worked. Uh, they blew up a, a, a East Asian airliner. Yeah, I believe that. I believe it was flight. Uh, I want to say it was, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, flight 434. I can't remember. It was the PAL flight. Yeah, uh, right. Going from Manila to, to Japan with an intermediate stop in Cebu, and mm -hmm. Ramsey placed the bomb under the seat in front of him and got off at Cebu, and the timer went off. It was just a, a Casio watch. They used yes. to, uh, wired it together on the plane. So they 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 knew that it could work. They blew up another they blew uh, another version of the bomb in a movie theater in, mm -hmm. in Manila, um, and they were all set to go. I mean, they had plans, um, and then KSM joined uh, Ramsey in the Philippines for several weeks in the fall of of ninety four, and then he went back home and then was planning to come back again in the early ninety five. Uh, when Ramsey, who was kind of a careless guy, anyhow, I mean, he, he once set off a bomb in his own face accidentally. Yes. Um, he just, you know, he w just wasn't careful. Uh, well, he he mixed the wrong chemicals together in a in an apartment building in Manila, and it didn't create a, an explosion, but it created just this horrible amount of smoke. And smoke is pouring out of this building, mm -hmm. and he and the guy who's with him at the time, a guy named Murad. You know, flee. And they're standing outside watching. You know, the cops come, the fire trucks come, um, and and Ramsey sends Murad back in to get his laptop. He left a laptop computer behind, right. and Murad stupidly goes, yeah, tries to go in, and then the cops see him. He starts running. He falls down. He gets caught, uh, and eventually the laptop is confiscated by the Philippine police, and eventually given to the FBI. And on the on the laptop are details of the plan for how these bombs would be placed, who would place them, that the 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 noms de guerre of the men who would place them, one of whom was KSM, one of whom was Ramsey, one of whom was Murad, and a couple other guys. Um, so that was it. And uh, Ramsey escaped again, uh, and KSM was not even in town at the time, so he he was free. They didn't even know who he was at that point. Right. I mean. Nobody. Had some glimmer. They knew there was a guy named Khalid who was living in Doha, Qatar, uh, who had sent money for the first World Trade Center bombing. And then they they see on this laptop evidence of a guy named Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, and they begin. There's one investigator in particular, a FBI agent named Frank Pellegrino, right, who begins to pick up the trail of KSM. 
Um, Ramsey gets caught. He gets dimed out for money uh, by one of his acolytes, some guy he recruited, uh, and gets picked up in Islamabad not, not long after, um, leaving KSM on the loose mm -hmm. and, and not shy about his future plans. Uh, and he takes the Bojenko plan and adapts it to replacing the bombs with pilots and 9-11. Right. Uh, and from there, uh, it seems that the intelligence community was still unaware of who this person was. And he had a nickname called Mukhtar. Um, and nobody knew who he was. And it's interesting you bring up Frank Pellegrino. Nobody really knows who this is. And he's such an important figure in between 93 and 9-11. And it seems that as we got closer to 9-11, he seems to be often forgotten, but yet he's the only lead investigator anywhere in the country that actually did chase Khalid Sheikh Mohammed all the way to Qatar. And there's a story, I believe, and you're quite, I'm probably, you're familiar with it. Um, uh, he goes to Qatar and he, he's actually surrounded by the CIA and the FBI. And he's, he's act, and they're fighting over who, which agency gets to apprehend him. And he escapes. Yeah, not not quite like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, they weren't fighting over who was going to apprehend them. They were fighting over who who wasn't going to be blamed. Ah, uh, uh, there was the, their um, the local ambassador, the U.S. ambassador there. Uh, the the Gunneries were an ally, and uh, as with Saudi Arabia, the oil they had their huge natural gas reservoirs in in gutter it's a tiny little country you know you could walk across it in a day um, but they had this enormous wealth and so for that reason they were allies of ours again and we didn't want to we as a country didn't want to offend them so we did we you know, ksm was living in doha as a guest of the government one of the members of the ruling family had set up kind of a an r and r post for jihadis who could come back from Afghanistan and rest there. And, and KSM was one of those. That's how he ended up there in the first place. And then got a job as an actual, an actual job as an engineer mm -hmm. in, the, in the electricity ministry. Uh, he didn't sit, seem to ever go to work very much, but, but he had a job and an income, moved his family there. Um, and it, after uh, Ramsey was caught, uh, Pellegrino, the FBI agent, focused almost exclusively on KSM after that, right. trying to figure out who he was, where he was, how to find him, because it was one of these things, he was always like just gone before they got there. Um, and he did what investigators do, you know, he just, it's just like, he's just on the prowl, he's on, he's pounding the pavement in, in Manila. And, you know, he, he, they went through all of the Back, you most people wouldn't be old enough, wouldn't remember this, but it used to be with hotels, every phone call in or out of a room had to go through a switchboard, and there would be records of every call made. So Pellegrino got all these phone records, traced down who belonged to the numbers, uh, just old-fashioned, you know, police work, and uh, some of the numbers led to uh, a bar girl, uh, and the bar girl turned out to have been uh, a girlfriend of Ramsey's. And she had a sister who was a girlfriend of KSM's. Um, and so they find out where she lives and, and they go out to interview her, like bribe the family with ice cream. Um, and, and, you know, they develop a relationship with them as they, as they, as they do. And Pellegrino is a very non-threatening persona. I mean, he's almost soft in a way. He's not, he's not a hard case. He's very friendly, seems approachable, likable guy. And his partner in this was a Port, Port Authority cop uh, named Matt Bashir. And Bashir yeah. was kind of the, the, the do-all fixer kind of guy. He was always prepared. He, all the, the, the details, he would take care of them. So he's the one who would buy the ice cream, take to the girls. And uh, they're talking to him one day. And, and he's, you know, it's kind of like the chat is like, you know, if you ever hear from him, you know, let me know. <laughs> Here's my number. Give me a call. He said, well, he does write occasionally. He said, what? Write, write what? He, said, he writes letters. And he says, he writes you letters? You know, like, uh, yeah, sure, I'll show you some. You know, <laughs> and she goes into her room and comes out with a stack of, of letters. Um, and, you know, they're, 
in English, which was the common language between the bar girl and, and KSM. And they're kind of flirty, but you know, uh, not not very useful content. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, Pellegrino notices one of the envelopes has a, it's like a form printed return address on it that's been whited out. And so he says, you know, can I have this? And so he takes the envelope and, and the FBI gets gets rid of the white the whiteout. And the address is the Ministry of Electricity in Doha. You know, <laughs> it's like, geez. And and uh, Pellegrino uh, then they contact the CIA, and the CIA has an asset who's able to track down where in Doha, which is not a very big town again, uh, KSM is where he works, and to confirm that it's him, which they do. They they get a fingerprint, uh, so now they they know where he is. And by this point, they they found out that he was one of the leaders of the Bojenka plot. So and he's a fugitive. He's been indicted in the United States in, in the Southern District of New York. Uh, and so it's just a simple it's a fugitive case. You're chasing him. That's why, because he's been indicted. We're going to bring him to trial. Um, so uh, with this knowledge, they, you know, the FBI takes the plan to, the, to their bosses at the Justice Department, the Attorney General, and it's like, look, we know where this guy is. We, we got to go get him. He's dangerous. And they say, yeah, we, we agree. We agree. But we can't just go and pick him up. We can't just kidnap him off the streets of Doha. We've got to have a plan. So there's a, a big meeting at the National Security Council about how to do this. And it turns out at the meeting, nobody wants any part of it. I mean, you know, the, the Pentagon proposes a plan. They knew, they knew it wouldn't be accepted. It was basically an invasion of, of gutter. You know, it was like with hundreds of people. And you, know, you, you only propose something like that because you know nobody's going to go along with it, so you don't get your hands dirty. Uh, the CIA didn't want to do it. They're all basically chicken shit. Uh, and so at least Pellegrino come up with a plan to try to lure KSM outside of Gutter to a friendly country where they could arrest him without causing embarrassment. Um, and they, they found a guy who knew him in, in Cairo. And the, the idea was that the guy would arrange a meeting with KSM in Cairo, and uh, and once they found out that the meeting was on, then uh, Pellegrino would fly on the same plane with KSM, and once they landed in Cairo, he would arrest them. Um, and so he's waiting for this to find out when the the, the meeting is set, when you know he's he's there for weeks, you know, when nothing's happening, mm -hmm. he's getting in arguments with the ambassador every day. He says, you know, look, look, let me, I'm a diplomat. Let me do this. This is my job. I know how to do this. I want to do this without getting anybody upset, but I'll find, I'll, I'll get the information for you. And then, you know, then you can follow him. You'll be out of my hair and everybody will be happy. Um, and okay. So he's, you know, Pellegrino's going nuts, of course. Uh, one day he's waiting at the, at the embassy and the, the ambassador's name is Pat Theros comes back and he says, he's gone. And Pellegrino goes, Who, what? He says, KSM is gone. And Frank goes, what? What are you talking about? He says, he somehow got tipped off. And he fled. He's, he's, he's left the country. And he's beside himself. With anger, mm. you know. And, uh, I mean, he just doesn't know what to do. It's just like, this is the chance to catch this guy. Uh, and he, he, he storms out. And then, you know, <laughs> he turns around before he leaves the, the, the room. And just says to Theros, he says, you motherfucker. <clears throat> no. And then he adds, sir. Turns around and <laughs> leaves. Um, you know, it turns out that was the best chance to catch KSM. That was the best chance to stop 9-11. If he caught him, it would never would have happened. I mean, if KSM had somehow been caught or killed before 9-11, 9-11 would never have occurred. If bin Laden had been caught or killed before 9-11, it would have been, it would have happened anyhow, 9-11. This KSM's deal wasn't Bin Laden's. And this right. was the, the one clear shot at him. And and he's gone. He's in the wind. Uh, I don't want to give too much away from the book as I want, you know, the readers to find out for themselves. I'm going to link both of the books in the description. So I'm going to jump six years later. You find yourself with Josh Meyer and you author The Hunt for KSM. What led you to write about him specifically? You know, it's funny. I, I was working on a profile of KSM, um, a magazine piece. 
And I was having a hard time, you know, even th this would have been in, I don't know, 08, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that much later, you know, KSM had been in American custody for years. It was still hard to find much r real information about him. Right. You know, I went back to Karachi, I went to Kuwait, you know, went to all the places he could find that he ever, had ever lived, went to Manila, um, you know, picking up traces. Um, but I was, have, I was struggling to come up with, you know, 10,000 words for a magazine piece. And Josh, who had been a reporting, uh, another reporter at the LA Times when I was there, uh, and had always wanted to do something, uh, a book with me. He called me up one day. He was in, by that point, he was living in D.C. and working there. He says, let's do a book on KSM. And I says, you know, great idea. I says, but I'm trying to do a magazine piece. And I can't build a magazine piece. I just don't know, know enough. I mean, there just isn't anything on the guy. It's just, it's, it's so slight. He says, well, no, not about him. It's about the guys who chased him. I go, who, who's that? You know, I didn't know, didn't know Pellegrino's name, didn't know anything about it. He says, no, it's, it's the hunt for KSM. It's not KSM. Um, and so that's why we did it. I mean, it was it was his idea entirely, right. um, and we we took it like he had really good uh, national security sources. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was like it's basically a cops and robbers story. And so Josh did the reporting on the cops, and I did the reporting on the robbers. Right. Uh, right. In this case, terrorists, uh, and the cops were FBI and CIA, and what whatever. So we joined up and 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 did this book. Yeah. In the in the preface, you tell the story about how KSM was found out. Uh, Ali Soufan, an FBI counterterrorism agent out of New York, began interrogating Abu Zubaydah, who was captured in Pakistan in a shootout. Now, Soufan had gotten Zubaydah to the point to point out who Mukhtar was, as he placed several photographs in front of him. Um, and it seemed the quiet and assured nature of Soufan was enough to get Zubaydah to talk. Yet. Uh, the Bush administration, under the influence of CIA Director George Tenet, persuaded the CIA to become the primary interrogators of all captured al-Qaeda subjects and used the FBI to interrogate subjects at first because the CIA weren't very good interrogators. However, later on, this led to the implementation of the SEER program and tortured confessions out of these people, including KSM. Um, it seemed in the book. This was a problem right off the start with the uh, with torture itself. Yeah, um, it, was, it was Sufan and another FBI agent. Right. Steve, and it was actually Godin who had the photos. That okay, right. right. Um, uh, and he and Sufan were, he and Sufan had been tasked once Zubeda was captured and flown out of Pakistan. He, he was severely wounded, almost died. Mm. Uh, and they were trying to stabilize him. They flew him to Thailand, uh, which was the first black site. And uh, Sufan and God were detailed to go. And, and they were actually told, you know, don't do anything on your own. <laughs> you know, the CIA is running this deal. You're just there to help. You're, you're there as subject experts. You know about this stuff. They don't really know anything. They don't, they don't uh, you know, their job is not, you know, chasing down crimes. Their job is to, predict the future and stop things from happening in the future. You know, we're cops, we, we find evidence and we have our ways and they have their ways. So just stay out of the way, but do whatever they ask you to do. And so they get there to Thailand and the CIA interrogators have not yet arrived. Hmm. Uh, they got something happened in DC and they were, the whole thing was kind of bungled. So they're there and uh, Zubayt is in critical state hmm. um, and Sufan and Gaudin are just waiting to be told what to do. And the local station chief says, you guys are fucking interrogators. Go interrogate them. And he says, well, we're not supposed to do anything. He says, you got my permission. Go do it. And so they go and they start you know, interrogating. And, and they're also trying to caring for the guy, too. I mean, because he's, yeah. he's wounded in the abdomen. So there's messy, you know, he's uh, you know, defecating all over the place. It was just a horrible thing. And they're they're doing what. FBI people are trained to do. They're trying to build rapport with the guy, you know, like try to try to persuade him to talk and to to not bullshit him. And they know enough that they can know when he's not telling the truth. And so the the point of the photos, Gowden had brought this PDA that had all of these suspects on it, these terrorism suspects. 
uh, and then some other people. I mean, just like it, you know, an Egyptian actor and things like that. Um, and they were just trying to like test whether Zubeda was telling them the truth or not. So he, he's paging through these things on the PDA, and and he says, "Well, that's so and so." He says, "No, that's not. Come on, like, don't bullshit us. We know who that is." Uh, and then he comes to the KSN's picture, and and Zubeda just goes shocked. He says, "Mukhtar, how did you know?" How did you know Mukhtar did 9-11? And, and they look at it and goes, oh, fuck you, Zubeda. Come on, Hani. Mm. That was his nickname, it was Hani. Yeah. He says, that's not, this isn't, this guy's not Al-Qaeda. That's Ramsey's uncle. That's KSM. He has nothing to do with Al-Qaeda. He says, no, 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 he, he did 9-11. And they're just like, are, what, are you kidding me? I mean, you know, KSM? And they walk out of the room and they say to, to the CIA people, he says, Frank's guy did 9-11. Frank's guy did it. And the CIA goes, who the fuck is Frank? <laughs> I mean, it's like, right, right. they have no idea. Right. Um, and that was that, that was in March of uh, 02. Uh, and so KSM, who was being chased by one man, Frank Pellegrino at that yeah. point, was now being chased by the entire U.S. government. Right. And still took a year to run him to ground. There was little information based on him. I mean, it's really fascinating to know that uh, only one agent really knew about him. And that was because what you brought up, uh, that he gave a check or uh, wire transfer to Ramsey Yusuf for the 93 bombing. That's what led him to look into KSM itself. Right. Um, but let's if, jump. Uh, no, yeah, go ahead. You can. I was going to say, he eventually got photographs, too, of, of KSM with Ramsey uh, from a raid in Pakistan. Ah, oh. so, so they, you know, they they had crumbs, but right. full picture. But they got they had enough evidence to get the guy indicted. Sure. Uh, now let's jump to the Philippines because so much begins here. Uh, the leading terrorist group there is Abu Sayyaf, and he's uh, the leader. Abdul Jarak Abar Janjalani um, is being supplied funding from a person named Muhammad Jamal Khalifa, who headed the International Islamic Relief Organization. And he's also married to one of bin Laden's sisters. Uh, right. can, a Khalifa supports Abu Sayyaf and also operatives from the 93 bombing and the Bajinka plot. And much of the funding came from a company called the, Benevol the Benevolence International Foundation. And it seemed that the Philippines was a staging point for terrorist operations, which you outlined in the book. Well, because there was a, there was a, a local terrorist organization in mm. full, full bloom. In the, I mean, the Philippines, for people who don't know, is a, I don't know how many hundreds of islands, but many, mm. many dozens and dozens. And in the, the far south was where the Abu Sayyaf was based. And, and they basically controlled this one island uh, and operated pretty much with impunity there. And then would, from there would stage raids to other islands, to other countries sometimes. Uh, but, the, but their main uh, task was trying to overthrow the the Philippine government. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was an insurgency, basically. It had been going on for a long time. And they took money wherever they could get it and mm -hmm. eventually got some from, from Al-Qaeda, from, you know, from whomever. Uh, there was another uh, local organization in, in Malaysia that provided some funding to them. Uh, I mean, these were real fighters. They, mm -hmm. they went, they, I mean, they were horrible cowards and everything else, but they went and killed people. They kidnapped people, mm -hmm. kidnapped tourists, um, whatever they could to raise money for you know, ransom attacks kind of thing. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, incidentally, uh, it's later reported that there was an informant inside Abu Sayyaf as well, uh, Edward Angeles. He went by the name Ibrahim Yaqub. Uh, and there's an interesting story behind this. Uh, he later reported that a man named the farmer was meeting with Ramzi Yusuf in Cebu City. And it came out later that the farmer would actually turn out to be uh, Terry Nichols, and he had a wife of Philippine descent. And shortly after their meeting in Cebu City, Nichols, along with Timothy McVeigh, would build a urea nitrate bomb, which was used in the Alpha P. Murrah building in Oklahoma City. Yeah, I don't know if there's any firm evidence that he, Nichols and Yusuf ever met. Um, I, I, I kind of doubt it. I mean, I pursued that for quite some time. Did you? Um, and was never able to confirm it at all. Um, who knows? Uh, but I, it, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, uh, Ramsey met with everybody and, you know, was a, 
uh, he, I think at one point, uh, Abu Sayyaf, had, he had offered to help train them in bomb making uh, techniques, how to do this. Um, and so he was, there was no doubt that he, he, was, he was down there at some point. And if he was there at the same time, I can't remember if the dates lined up or not when Nichols was there. Right. But, he, but he could have. I mean, as I said, that world is a small world. Yes. People tend to know one another. In chapter nine of the book, you mentioned KSM was in Karachi, while the CIA station there was completely unaware that he was being involved in plots there. Was the Pakistan Intelligence Service, the ISI, protecting KSM by not supplying any information to the CIA, which was uh, basically their, their, they despised the United States, which goes back to the days of the Afghan-Soviet conflict? I, I don't think the, the ISI knew who KSM was. Huh. Uh, I remember talking with agents after he was caught. I think this is in the book. Uh, but he says, you know, it's remarkable. Everybody we pick up now knows KSM. And and we didn't know anything about him. We, he wasn't on our radar at all. And the guy said, you know, the man must have no ego at all uh, because he's just, he's just smoke. There's nobody there. And I wrote this in a newspaper story for the LA Times, and it somehow at Guantanamo, one of the pretrial hearings at Guantanamo, somebody gave KSM the newspaper, and he's reading it, and he comes to that line where he, he must have no ego at all. And he just breaks up laughing. I mean, the guy's got a monstrous ego. Yeah, right? he's, he's just yeah. he's an egomaniac. Yes, he is. Pathological egomaniac. But he says, yeah, "Look at this! Look at this! He has no ego." You know, it's, yeah. But so I, I think the ISI was bewildered. They, they just, you know, the ISI is, is very powerful uh, and is, is large, well-funded, but I don't think particularly capable in a lot of ways. They end up killing a lot of the wrong people. I mean, they've done, you know, I, they, they killed dozens of reporters. Yes. Which is, you know, not something a sophisticated organization would do, right? I mean... They killed one of my fixers. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think that they were, they're, you know, they really didn't care about uh, Al Qaeda at all, because they don't really didn't care about Afghanistan. They they care about Kashmir. I mean, that's their that's that's their big thing, and oh, most of what they do is oriented in that direction. So it's like the opposite side of the country from Afghanistan. Um, to them, Afghanistan was just, they, they wanted to keep it safe, keep it open so that they couldn't be attacked from there. Right. But, but, but the, whatever was going on there, it's the same way now with the Taliban, right? I mean, they've, right. they've, they've helped fund the Taliban. They, 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 they facilitate movement to, through, through, Pakistan, you know, most of the most of the Taliban leaders were educated in in Pakistan. Uh, yeah, it's a, I yeah, I don't know. Pakistan's a mess right now, and and the ISI is one of the principal reasons why. Yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, just to add to that, uh, the only reason why the ISI even got involved in the Afghan Soviet War was they feared that the communist bloc would invade. Pakistan next and either destroy it or weaken it and India would take advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, there's so much uh, mess in Pakistan. I agree with you there. Um, an interesting point in the book too, something I, this is really not known by a lot of people, especially in the more invested researchers of 9-11. Uh, and you wrote about it in the book and you're one of the few people that has. Yoshri Fuda, a, a BBC correspondent, it, he received the facts regarding a, a potential interview between KSM and Ramzi bin al-Sheikh, uh, who are the orchestrators of the planes operation. Now, Fuda is invited to Rao Pindi, and he stays for two days, and he interviews both KSM and al-Sheikh, and where, according to Fuda, they both confess about their involvement to 9-11 attacks. And afterwards, Fuda told his editors at the BBC, which got word back, I think one of them was friends with Tenet, director Tenet of CIA, and Almost immediately afterwards, Al Sheeb gets caught, uh, and then Raul, and then KSM and Rao Pindi. Can you tell our listeners how KSM was captured? Because 
there was reports from Pakistan, disinformation, if you will, which said that he was killed in action or that uh, he was captured in one place, was captured in another. And one of those stories about where he was killed was re later reported by India Times. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. The, um, yeah, Fuda uh, didn't know, uh, he had no reason to believe that he was actually going to meet with these guys hmm. when he was invited. And they didn't just confess, they bragged about 9 yeah. 11. That was the whole point of inviting him there. Um, uh, and, and, and then they confiscated all of his recording equipment and notes and everything before he left. This was in Karachi, not for Okay. Um, and, uh, I mean, he could easily have met the fate of Danny Pearl, right? Mm -hmm. You go, you go meet people you don't know, uh, it's dangerous business. So, you know, less is hard. I mean, that, that's, that's. I mean, when I went to Karachi the first time, I had was not long after Pearl Pearl's death had been discovered, oh. and I had rules. You know, I was going to, you know, people who are working this these stories all kind of knew one another. There's, there weren't that many people still chasing 9/11 stuff by you know by 2000 late 2002, um, and we we would when we found out about Pearl would tell one another was like you know. He wasn't really one of us. He wasn't a real serious reporter. You know, he was basically a feature writer. Uh, and, you know, none of us would be stupid enough to, you know, get in a car with somebody you don't know, go to a place uh, in a room with somebody you don't know in Karachi, because it was well known how dangerous it was. And so when I first got to Karachi, it was just after uh, Ramsey Ben Sheba had been caught. Um, and I, you know, I sat in my hotel room for a week and didn't get any information, didn't get anything because I couldn't, you know, couldn't, couldn't go here, couldn't go there, wasn't safe. Right. And eventually you find yourself doing the same stupid shit that Pearl did. You find yourself meeting people you don't know in places you don't know in the dark. You find yourself in the trunk of cars. You know, you, you end up doing just incredibly stupid stuff hmm. and just chasing the story. And that's, you know, I used to think that was admirable. Now I'm, I'm, 100% certain that it's just pure vanity, right? You don't want to, you want the story and not because the story was important, but because you're vain. <laughs> and that, that's what you do is you get the story. Sure. Uh, so, yeah. So he gets caught in a gunfight, big gunfight in a defense colony in the neighborhood of, of, of Karachi. And um, there, the same week, I can't remember if it was the day before or the day after, uh, they they raid another apartment uh, and inside find two of KSM's sons um, and a caretaker and a nanny basically um, and find out that KSM had just been there himself um, and when, when they were when they captured Ramsey um, that that's who they, they were actually looking for KSM not not they didn't really care that much about Ramsey. Um, so he, he got away. He'd just been there. One of the cops said it was like the you know, scene in the Western where the you get there and the the, the campfire is still the embers are still burning in the campfire, but the the outlaw is gone. Mm. And so that was in September of '02. And there were they started picking up signs of KSM here and there and everywhere uh, for a while, and eventually. Uh, just like Ramsey, Yusuf, he gets dimed out by a friend, yeah. um, the guy he had known growing up, uh, uh, who was a fellow Baluk. Uh, and he had he just walked into the U.S. Embassy in, in Islamabad, you know, months earlier, like a year earlier, uh, and told them that he knew KSM and he thought he could arrange a meeting with him. Mm. And, you know, what could you do for me? Well, by that point, it was a $25 million reward for KSM's capture. Mm. And they said, well, how about $25 million? Um, and, you know, curiously, uh, this he, he this was discussions with the CIA between the, the informant and the CIA. Um, and the guy who was handling this walk-in got transferred out. 
uh, and the CIA station kind of dropped the ball. You know, they didn't know didn't know if they should believe the guy or not. So he kind of just disappeared for a while. Uh, this guy who offered to help catch KSM, and he's just out you know, walking the streets. But eventually he comes back, and somebody's smart enough to believe him. And sure enough, he arranges a, a meeting with KSM in Rollo um on a night in April of 03. And KSM is on the road. He's, by that point, he knows he's being chased, and he's staying basically in a different place every night. And he, he had been in Peshawar the day before he met with Zawahiri. He had met with bin Laden like just a couple days before. Uh, he had become more security conscious and quit using telephones of any sort. He was just pretty much using messengers, human, human messengers to carry things back and forth. Uh, but he agreed to meet this guy, uh, this Baluki, uh, in the evening after he drove in from Peshawar. Um, and the guy meets with them, and he has a he, the, the lure for KSM was that the, but the Baluki guy would he said he could provide funding for him. Mm. He had a way to get to get money and, and get it to KSM. And KSM, but you know, at that point, he's always looking for money to fund things. Um, so he shows up and they meet their old friends, you know, they talk. Uh, the, the informant, you know, excuses himself, and goes to the bathroom. And texts the is KSM uh, the CIA handler and says I'm with KSM. Uh, and soon after the meeting ends, the guy leaves the house. It's a house owned by a oddly enough a Pakistani army major hmm. uh, and a, a, and his wife who were prominent politicians in the in that area. Uh, anyhow, the guy leaves and at two in the morning. Um, the ISI and the CIA bust down the doors. And they find KSM asleep in his pajamas. Yeah. He, uh, they, I think what they did was, for one, pick because he was such a, uh, you know, a, a decent looking fellow. I think they messed up his hair and wanted to make him look disheveled uh, for the public because there was pictures in Pakistan showing him in a suit when he was younger and stuff like yeah. that, praising him. And I think that famous picture where they catch him, he's in a white shirt, right. halfway tired. Um, all right, so he's captured. Um, he's taken to, to numerous black sites, uh, CIA waterboards, I think it's 183 times. I, I still can't believe it. Um, he tells his interrogators almost everything, but he tells them a lot of lies too. However, there seems to be a problem uh, that any information obtained under duress cannot be used as evidence for the alleged crimes. Do you think this is, is this the reason why we haven't had a trial after 18 years since his capture? Uh, it, it's the sole reason. I mean, <clears throat> it's not, uh, it's uh, not an assumption. I mean, really? it's, it's fact. I mean, I've been to I don't know, countless days of these pretrial hearings at Guantanamo. And for the first many years, you, 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 the word torture couldn't even be used in the courtroom. It would set off an alarm. It would shut down communications. Uh, white noise would go on. A, like mm. a hockey light would start flashing. Mm. Uh, and it was nobody in the courtroom even knew who controlled the light. It was being controlled off-site by the CIA. So the, the whole difficulty with the, the prosecutions at Guantanamo is that the from day one, the CIA has tried to hide what it did to these guys, which at this point is beyond foolish since everybody knows what they did. Uh, why they continue this this sham, I don't have any idea. Um, so you're, you're right. I mean, um, when KSM was interrogated, he, he spoke voluminously. He was pretty careful not to give much actionable intelligence of anything in the future. He would talk about past things or this or that. Um, and very little use of information came out of torturing any of these guys. Uh, and some of the torture was horrific. I mean, it's yeah. just, I mean, hard to imagine. Um, and so 
almost all litigation at Guantanamo has been efforts by the defense to bring to light what had happened to their clients under CIA custody and the CIA's effort through the military prosecution to not allow that to be brought to light. That's that's they've been arguing about that since these things started in well the new round started in 2012. Hmm. Uh, but they originally 2007 is when they started. Um, so n- now, I mean, weirdly, just before the pandemic, um, at a hearing, after a decade of, of refusing to talk about any of this, the chief interrogators for the CIA testified at Guantanamo it, ex- and explicitly described what they did. And, and, and one of them said, you know, I would gladly do it again. Yeah, I believe that was James Mitchell who said that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. He's a he's a piece of work. Uh very, obviously a very bright guy, uh, very prideful, yeah. um, uh, and feels like he's been thrown under the bus by the CIA. Um, I mean, they would like trying to describe he and his partner uh Jessen as kind of rogue operators when they weren't whatsoever. Right. They, everything they did was approved up the ranks, right. up to the White House, the Bush White House. Um, they did it for sure. Um, and they claim it was really effective, but the effectiveness seems disputable. Um, you know, the, one of the interesting things about the torture, um, KSM was captured in 03 and was taken to Guantanamo in 07 or late 06, I guess. Uh, almost all of the torture occurred the first couple of months. After that, he was just, he was, he was there, you know, <laughs> um, there, there wasn't much more to ask him about. Um, they did continue to conver- have conversations with him. But yeah, so none of that information could be used in court, even in a, a military commission court. Hmm. So they, they came up with this plan to, to reinvestigate the crimes. To reinvestigate 9/11, and to to reinterrogate the prisoners, including KSM, and the people he turned to to do that uh, for KSM was Frank Pellegrino. Yeah, and so these so-called clean teams, uh, the teams whose whose work wouldn't be tainted by torture, would produce admissible evidence. Um, and so they flew to Guantanamo and, and interrogated these guys. Pellegrino spent three or four days interrogating KSM and eventually KSM confessed to everything. Uh, and they had a case, they thought. Well, uh, as the trials, the pretrial hearings have gone on at Guantanamo, the, the defense has um, made a concerted effort to try to erase any line between the CIA custody and the FBI interrogations to mm-hmm. say that how would a the basic argument is how would a prisoner know what organization you belong to? Mm-hmm. Why would they think that that Pellegrino was in fact clean, right? Why why would, what 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 evidence could they have that this this was safe to talk about? And the original judge in the trials, a, a, an army uh, colonel named Paul uh, James Paul, um, there. The prosecution and the, the discovery has been going on for 10 years, right? Um, and the prosecution has dragged its feet at almost every possible moment. And, you know, eight years in, you know, thousands of pages of documents mm. would show up in discovery. Stuff that had been asked for in 2008, you know. Um, and uh, Paul eventually ruled that because of the the difficulty with discovery and the prohibitions the prosecution the military placed on the defense who they could talk to who they couldn't talk to he said okay if you're gonna if that's if that's the way you're gonna play the game fine you cannot use the clean team interrogations as evidence that's gone you're gonna have to do something else and then he retired (laughs) Paul, the judge uh and everybody's just (laughs) agape uh so they got a new judge. The new judge, first thing he does is reinstates the clean team evidence. Huh. He says, we'll have a hearing. We'll have hearings on it. Uh, but I'm not going to make a decision to exclude it until we have the hearings. And so, and then 
And then he he retires. And there's another judge. And he says, well, let's have the hearings. And they started having the hearings before the pandemic. And they're still going on. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, torture is, I mean, guilt or innocence is not the issue at Guantanamo. The issue is torture. It's the sole issue. Right. And, you know, the thing, there's now, I think, 39 guys, prisoners left there. There were 800. Most of them who weren't, weren't guilty of anything other than being in the wrong right. place at the wrong time were sold for bounty, basically, by the Afghans. Uh, and most of them have, have returned home or somewhere else in the world. So these 40 guys, 39 guys left. And I don't know, I can't remember what the number is, but you can look it up. I mean, Carol uh, Rosenberg has written about this mm. extensively for the yes. Miami Herald and the New York Times. But the, the annual cost for each prisoner is something like $20 million. You know, they've got a guard force of 800 people to guard 39 guys. It's just, it, it, it's just, it's, it's security theater. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. The courtroom itself is fascinating. It's a big room. It's like a small auditorium. Um, and nobody's allowed inside except for the lawyers and the defendants and the judge and the legal teams. So there's a gallery behind it that's, you know, it's like triple pane glass between you and the courtroom. The audio feed into the, the gallery is on a 45 second delay. So you'll see things happening in the courtroom and, and it has no nothing to do with what's being the audio you're hearing. And then, you know, when the blue light goes on, then the audio gets cut off too. So uh, it's just this ridiculous kind of thing. Uh, yeah, you can't wear your watch into the gallery. <laughs> and for a long time, you couldn't use a ballpoint pen. You had to use pencils to take notes. What, uh, what, why is it? Because it's it's the military, you know. It's, it's so you don't, I guess, attack somebody. I don't, I don't know. Uh, it, it's you had you have assigned seats in the gallery, and the and the uh, invariably my seat would be behind a post. You know, so you're you know the courtroom is right there, and you're looking straight at a post. And if you try to move, I I, I moved the first time I, I did this. I said, and there's empty chairs that are full, so I just moved a couple of chairs down. And I w one of the guards comes over and says, you can't you can't sit there. I says, why not? There's nobody here. I can't see. Now he says, yeah, but you're assigned the seat. You have to stay there. I says, well, assign me a different seat. He says, well, okay, but we'll have to call the Pentagon. I said, are you shitting me? You know, you have to get Pentagon approval for a reporter to move, you know, six feet to his left. It was, it's just, it's, you know, it's the military. They, they just, they, nobody can think, you know, they follow rules. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't even know what to say after hearing that. Um, let me ask you, what, what are you doing today? Are you still involved with 9-11 at some, at some level or? Um, well, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm planning to do a book on the trials. Okay. When, uh, when did, uh, how long do you see yourself finishing this book? Well, it, it depends on when, when, I don't know when, when the trial is going to be. Oh, when the trials. Okay. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, good luck with that. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm not sure for, for the longest time, I didn't think there would be a trial ever. And then for about a year, I thought that there would. Now I'm starting to wonder again. I, I don't know mm. what's going to happen. If, if Biden follows through and, uh, closes the prison then i don't know what happens um the the prisoners have to go somewhere the military commissions the trials have to go somewhere nobody knows where nobody has plans for where um i think the most likely outcome is that and and this was the biden or the obama administration was trying to negotiate this would would be plea deals with the 9-11 defendants they would take the death penalty off the table in exchange for guilty pleas. Mm. And then they'd put them in prison somewhere for the rest of their lives. Uh, I still think that's the most likely outcome. Um, yeah, you think so? Yeah, yeah I do. I, well, because, I, you know, certainly for KSM, uh, who's made no secret of what he did and why and I mean, he sees himself as a revolutionary soldier. He compares himself to George Washington. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, that's not bullshit. I mean, he thinks, he believes that. Um, and so he's proud of what he did. Um, 
some of the other defendants, there's five defendants in the trial. Um, one of them is his nephew uh, who helped arrange logistics for the hijackers mm. as they transited through the Emirates through Dubai to the United States. Um, doesn't seem to be a crime on the scale of what KSM did. Uh, so I'm not sure all of them would take plea deals. Right. Uh, I, I KSM probably would. I don't know. We'll see if that, that's that's yet to be determined. If 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 that's the route that the Biden administration goes, if they return to that, right. Strategy. It's a shame that because you wrote in the book too um, that this trial didn't take place in New York where it should have been. You know, Kevin Duffy died. Uh, the judge uh, who did the Yousef trials did a hundred terrorism trials. Yeah, this trial would have been three months and done. At best, right. Yeah. And KSM would have been, you know, in Florence. Yeah. yeah. Supermax or, or somewhere. Uh, and it would have been over with. And, you know, the, the only reason it wasn't was a, just political cowardice, basically, on the part of the Congress, mm -hmm. who passed a, a law saying no money could be spent to transfer these guys, the prisoners, to the United States, to bring them to the United States. And the reasoning was that, I mean, because... <laughs> Uh, you know, Obama had him, uh, Holder had him indicted again in the Southern District yeah. in, in 20, whatever year that was, 2012, I guess. No, 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. Um, and the reason was, that, and this is what Schumer, Chuck Schumer, the senator from New York, said, was who voted with the Republicans on this, says, we don't want to turn New York into a target. And I went, are you kidding me? I, wait, you, you heard about 9-11, right? I mean, you, you think New York wasn't already a target? Yeah. You heard about the '93 bombing, right? It just yeah. it just makes it it begs sense. It makes no sense whatsoever to me. Uh. And as I said, they've had hundreds of they tried hundreds of terrorists. Um, and yeah, if they put these in front of Kevin Duffy, I mean, that guy ran a no nonsense courtroom, mm. you know, and this 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 stuff would have been done. Terry McDermott, author of Perfect Soldiers and the Hunt for KSM. Thank you for coming on today. You're welcome. Good, good to talk to you.